All right. Well, as you see, I'm going to do a PowerPoint today because we're getting into an introduction into the Gospel of Matthew. And so there's a lot of information that I just want to convey. It's a kind of a different format for me. I'm not very good with PowerPoint, so uh, let's pray over this message, please. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you. We praise you, God, for your word. Uh, we thank you that not only have you spoken it, um, you have continued to preserve it, that we would have it today. And, and God, there is a, a track record of the faithfulness and not only, again, in you giving us your word, but in you preserving that word. And God, we just are so grateful and thankful that we have this, the truth, what a precious gift it is. And so as we, we look to uh, this gospel, God, I pray that you would help me not to pervert anything or distort anything or misrepresent it. Help me not to speak falsehood. If there is uh, anything that I might say that is not of you, that is not true, would you please supernaturally stop me, God? We desire the truth. Uh, help us, God, to, to have eyes to see it and ears to hear it and hearts to conform to it. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So again, it's it, kind of today is a different format. A lot of information that I'm going to be throwing at you, things that I think are important as we, before we jump into uh, the Gospel of Matthew that we kind of understand as a setting uh, before we get into it. So some of the information, it's a little bit dry. I do apologize beforehand. Uh, if you would like to take a nap, just, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Don't take a nap. No, I hope, I hope that it's uh, good information. I think it's relevant information. Um, again, the, the idea that, that we have the truth of God that he has preserved for us. You know, we're going on 2,000 years um, removed from when Matthew wrote this gospel. And there were so many perversions that went out, and, and God has stayed true to his word to preserve it so that, that we can have it today. And our faith is not just a blind faith. We don't just, you know, hope in these things that there's no evidence. Uh, God has given us so much evidence uh, for his word, for the validity of his word as we look throughout history. Uh, that we can connect all these dots back to the original apostles and obviously the apostles who saw Jesus. They walked with him. They knew him. Uh, they, they heard all this uh, from Christ himself. And so we're going to be looking at some of this information. Um, first, as we think of the gospel, uh, we use this word often, but what is gospel? Uh, the English word gospel comes from the Anglo-Saxon word God spell which can mean a story about God or a good story. And the latter meaning is in harmony with the Greek word translated gospel, which is euangelion. And in the Greek, euangelion means good news. So whenever you're looking through the scriptures and you see the good news of Christ, the good news of the Savior, the good news of the Messiah, that we go and we preach good news, this is that Greek word, euangelion. And so euangelion is found throughout uh, secular writings from uh, Greek history. And so euangelion means a good news about a significant uh, or important event that happened in human history. So you'll see writings that talk about euangelion. It's good news. It's about something significant. It's, it's obviously a good report. Um, we as followers of Christ use euangelion, this good news, this gospel, to signify the most Significant, the most important uh, thing that has happened in human history, and that is Christ. This is when we talk about the gospel, we're talking about what Christ has done for us. And there's a lot of people who profess faith in Jesus Christ that they don't really understand this euangelion. They don't really understand the gospel. They don't know why it's good news, right? They know something about Jesus, something about a cross. But as far as the implications of it, it can be lost on them. So understanding truly why this is good news. You know, the bad news that we are separated from God because of our rebellion, because of our sin. And God put on flesh to do what only he could do, which is live a perfect life without rebellion, without sin. And then he lays that perfect life down as an atoning sacrifice to cover the multitude of sins for you and I. That on the cross, uh, God the Father poured out his wrath upon the Son. The wrath that you and I deserve because of our sin, because of our rebellion, poured out on the Son. 
But not only did Jesus die and take the punishment that we deserve, he rose again, demonstrating that death has no power over him. He has all power, all authority, all dominion, and he reigns on high. And so through faith in the shed blood of Christ, we too can have eternal life in the kingdom of God. This is the good news. There's so much bad news, and there's so much heartache, and there's so much pain, and there's so much loss, and then we have death. We all die. But for the believer, it's a transition that these broken bodies that are perishing, we will go and we will put on these new eternal bodies. And we will dwell with God in his kingdom forever and ever. So in light of all the garbage that is happening, we have good news. And that's, that's the message of the Gospels. They, they talk about the, the life and the ministry and the sacrifice and the resurrection and the reign of Jesus Christ. And so we need to understand as Christians what the gospel is. That we truly do have good news. You've probably heard of something called the synoptic gospels. Uh, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are part of these three synoptic gospels. So all four gospels are within the canon of scripture. They've been heavily scrutinized. When the truth went out, perversion of the truth went out at the very same time. And people were posing as apostles, writing perverted gospel messages. And there was a lot of scrutiny that would go in in the early church to say whether these gospels truly are from the apostles and if they're actually what they said and actually what Christ himself said. And so there's so much scrutiny that goes into it. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are, these are the Gospels within the canon of Scripture, this, this selection of, of the, the, the Gospels of Jesus. And then within that canon, we have the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they share a common perspective that is not shared by John. Remember, these are individuals, they're, they're writing from their perspective the things that the Holy Spirit is putting upon their hearts, that these are the things of importance, and they'll highlight that in their account of Christ. Um, so that is why these three Gospels are known as the Synoptic Gospels. This comes from the Greek word meaning to see together or to share a common point of view. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they have a very common theme. They're covering a lot of the same uh, situations that happened. Um, so there's a, a lot of commonality, a lot of similarity within Mac, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And that is why they are called the Synoptic Gospels. A couple of examples of the three that they hold together. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they focus on Jesus' Galilean ministry. So the northern portion and John focuses on his ministry in Judea. So this is more in the south. All of it happened, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they are primarily focused on this northern ministry. John focuses a lot on the southern ministry. The Synoptic Gospels record numerous parables. Did you know that John records no parables? It's an interesting note. As you look through John, it's... You know, they all record these parables. So does it mean because John doesn't record them that they didn't happen? Of course not. It's just that's not what John, that was not his emphasis. Um, his emphasis is really to show the deity of Christ. And so he didn't record a lot of the parables, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they do. John in the Synoptic Gospels record only two common events that took place prior to the Passion Week. Jesus walking on water and the feeding of the 5,000. So you'll see those, uh, those historical events in all four Gospels. These Gospels accounts, they do not contradict, but they complement one another. Again, taken together, the Gospels form a unified account and testimony of Jesus Christ. So that's why it's so important that we let precept determine precept. Right? The, the, the Scriptures are not to be taken in isolation. The scriptures are a tapestry of this picture of God, who he is, and what he has done for us. And so you, we can get so much from one gospel, but God has given us these four accounts of the good news of Jesus. And the way that we best understand them and interpret them is all four gospels in light of one another. Each gospel writer wrote from a unique perspective, and they write to a different audience. And so that's going to drive it, right? If I'm preaching a message 
to a room full of unbelievers, I'm going to gear that message a little bit differently than I would to a room full of believers, right? So it could be the exact same message, but the way that I approach it and the way that I teach it is going to be different depending on the audience that I'm speaking to. And so these gospels were given to a first century audience, the first century church. These gospels were an account of who Jesus is, what he fulfilled, what he came to do, and it's given to a particular audience. Now, in God's providence, it it was for us as well. But as you'll see in Matthew, uh, Matthew's audience is primarily a Jewish audience, and we see that evident through the way that he conveys information. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But again, all these unique perspectives uh, given aid by the Holy Spirit, writing these four Gospels that tell one beautiful, cohesive story about Jesus Christ. I just thought this was a neat illustration that you see here. Uh, like you, in Mark, the things that are unique that you'll only find in Mark, about 23.5% of his gospel, you'll only see in the gospel of Mark. Uh, in Luke, about 60% of Luke's gospel is, is unique to what Luke is writing. And Matthew, 45.5% roughly, is unique to the gospel of Matthew. So they're all bringing an element that you're not going to find in the other Gospels. That's why it's so imperative that we have all four. That's why God has given that to us. And then you see here, the reason why these are considered the synoptic Gospels is this triple tradition. You have Mark, Luke, and Matthew all sharing quite a bit in common in their Gospels. And you see Mark and Mark and Luke share quite a bit. Uh, Mark and Matthew, uh, Luke and Matthew and then again, this, this triple tradition. Again, it's not contradictory, it's complementary. Uh, it's all telling this cohesive story about Jesus Christ. So who wrote the Gospel of Matthew? Kind of seems like a question that has an intuitive answer, but you know, we take these things for granted. There's been a lot of study, there's a lot of history that goes into us making a claim as bold as Matthew, and not just a Matthew, but Matthew, the apostle, wrote this gospel. We're not just making these things up. It's not just because, well, Matthew was an apostle, and here's a, here's a, here's a gospel that we've entitled Matthew, so it must be Matthew. So how do we know if Matthew wrote this gospel? Because none of the gospels included the names of the author in the original manuscripts. So they are all technically anonymous. However, the original recipients of the letters knew who authored them, right? So if I brought a letter to Intermount Baptist Church, um, do I need to write my name at the title of it? Or you guys know, you guys know who gave it to you. You guys know me. You know who gave you the letter. Um, part of this, too, is that the gospel writers are not trying to elevate themselves. This gospel message is not about them. The gospel message is about the one that they represent. It's about Christ. So they're not sitting here trying to exalt self. Now, Paul and some of the other epistles are different. These are letters to churches. And so they're going to have an introduction. They're going to have a greeting. You see these in the format. The Gospels are different. The Gospels are just an account of Christ and his time in ministry and his death and his resurrection. Uh, But again, this is imperative that we know the original recipients of the letters they would know who authored them. So we look to history to see what they said. Who did they say authored these letters? Uh, The earliest traditions of the church are unanimous in attributing the first gospel to Matthew. And not just some random guy named Matthew, but Matthew, who was a former tax collector, who uh, followed Jesus and became one of his 12 disciples. Okay, that makes it very specific to what Matthew we're talking about. And again, this is unanimous. As you look through uh, the the documentation, the ancient literature, um, there's no quarreling about this. There's no other person that is named as the author. There's not a group of people that are named as the author. The early church tradition is unanimous that this Matthew, former tax collector, follower of Jesus, part of the 12 disciples, he is the one who wrote this gospel. The earliest and most important of these traditions comes from the second century writings of Papias. He lived in AD 60 to 130. He was the bishop of Heropolis in Asia Minor. 
Again, these claims are rooted in history. This stuff ha- actually happened. These people actually existed. They actually wrote documentation that we can follow and trace back to the original source. Okay, so again, uh, some of the most important of these traditions comes from the second century writings. Uh, Papias is one of them, bishop in Asia Minor. Um, he was a disciple of the Apostle John and a friend of Polycarp the Martyr. So we know that Polycarp and now Papias, they both discipled under John. I mean, how incredible would that be to, if you got to be discipled by somebody, being discipled by one of the twelve. Being discipled by John. So here's these connections. You have Jesus. You have the 12 apostles. John, who was sent out with the Great Commission, right? Go and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey all that I have commanded. John is doing that. He's going and he's making disciples. And we know that Papias and Polycarp were his disciples. They followed John. John, the one who knew Jesus, walked with Jesus, listened to Jesus, He is the one who they should listen to when it comes to accounts about Jesus. And we know Polycarp, he was martyred in the Colosseum because of his faith in Jesus Christ. So Papias, he wrote a five-volume history of the Gospels entitled Explanations of the Sayings of the Lord. Now, a lot of this documentation has been lost over time, but we do have fragments of these writings that have been found in the works of Irenaeus, who was the Bishop of Lyons, and he was ordained by Polycarp, right? So, so you have Jesus to John, John to Polycarp, Polycarp to Irenaeus, and he was a bishop again in Lyons in France, uh, between 130 and 200 was his life, and then also another writer, Eusebius, who was a bishop of Caesarea, who came a little bit later on. So their writings Uh, show us that they have fragments and we find the earliest known reference to the authorship of Matthew. So in their writings, they're documenting that Matthew is indeed the author of the gospel of Matthew. These early church leaders had either direct or indirect contact with the apostolic community and would have been very familiar with the gospel's beginnings. And so again, when, when we see through history that Matthew is accredited as being the author of Matthew that's rooted in history. It's something that we can trust. It's not just a blind faith that we're supposed to close our eyes and just say, okay, somewhere along the line, somebody said that that this probably came from Matthew. We have history that makes direct connections that, that the Apostle Matthew, again, is the author of this gospel. And that's important because, again, Matthew knew Jesus. Matthew is the one that I want to hear about. I want, I want to hear his testimony about Christ. I don't want to hear somebody who heard something or something who knew a guy hundreds of years later. We want the eyewitness testimony of those who knew Jesus or at least knew those who knew Jesus. These firsthand accounts. So uh, more evidence of Matthew as author. Uh, Origen Adamantius Uh, He was a theologian and Bible scholar in history. He lived in 185 to 254 AD. It's said of him that he was one of the most important theologians and biblical scholars of the early Greek church. And now we have Eusebius quotes Origen here um, in his writings, Ecclesiastical History. Okay, so Eusebius is quoting Origen in his writings, Ecclesiastical History. He writes this, Among the four Gospels, which are the only indisputable ones in the church of God under heaven, I have learned by tradition that the first was written by Matthew, who was once a publican, but afterwards an apostle of Jesus Christ, and it was prepared for the converts from Judaism. So again, historical documentation. This is important things that he hits on here. Among the four Gospels, which are the only indisputable ones in the church of God under heaven. Again, there were a lot of perverted Gospels that went out in this time. As soon as the truth went out, perversions of that truth went out. And so the, the, the early church tradition, they accepted these four Gospels as being genuine by scrutinizing them heavily. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and out of these four Gospels, he has learned by tradition that the first was written by Matthew. Matthew. 
So the first gospel account being written by Matthew, who was once a publican, but afterwards an apostle of Jesus Christ, and it was prepared for the converts from Judaism. Again, it's saying that we know not only is it reliable and trustworthy, it was written by Matthew, but the audience was primarily Jewish believers. And you'll see that as you look at Matthew, and we'll kind of look at some of the evidences of his audience, that it would have primarily been Jews. And so the way that Matthew organizes his gospel, you can see it's, it's to show Jewish people that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. Uh, now, there's some scholars that have a conflict here. Who, which gospel actually came first? There's some evidence that Mark's gospel came first. There's some evidence that Matthew's gospel came first. Um, there, Matthew or Mark's gospel is dated about mid 50s AD. Matthew's about mid to late 50s AD. Some go into early 60s, uh, but then we get into his death, and I'll talk about that. But um, they they have this because. Mark and Matthew share a lot of similarities in their gospel accounts. So we know that either Matthew uh, took some from Mark or Mark, which who wrote the gospel of Mark? John Mark's writing it, but who's he writing it for? Peter, right? So Peter is the first-hand account, one of the apostles. So Mark's gospel is really Peter's gospel, but John Mark is writing it. So either Matthew saw some of this information and said, I'm not going to reinvent the will, because again, it's, it's to give this testimony of Jesus Christ. And if Mark already has a gospel written out, they saw the same things. He said, yeah, this is fantastic. I'm just going to put this in my gospel account with some other things. Or Mark saw Matthew's gospel that came first, and he did the same thing. But whoever came first, it really doesn't matter. They're both promoting the exact same story about Jesus Christ. And they have other elements that they're adding to it as well. But again, the date is important. The date is important. Um, primarily, the death of Matthew. Uh, Matthew, uh, historians say he died probably around 60 AD. He would have died in Ethiopia. Uh, this was where he primarily did his missionary work, was in Ethiopia. And he was martyred in Ethiopia, slain by a halberd. This is how he died. Sometimes when we read through this, and it's like, oh, he's slain by Halbert, he was a martyr. But pause for a moment. This is what killed this man. I mean, these are gruesome deaths that happened to the original apostles and so many brothers and sisters throughout our history that gave their lives for the gospel of Christ so that you and I could have it today. Right? The enemy, which is Satan himself, has taken a lot of effort to quiet and silence those with the truth. And you had men that were willing to stand for the truth and die even excruciating deaths like this. And why? Well, it's, it's like Matthew actually believed and knew that Jesus was the Christ. He actually believed that this life is passing us by. It's so temporary. It's like a vapor. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. And so his investment was not in this life. His investment is the, in the kingdom of God. He actually heard Jesus tell him, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I go, you one day will also be. And so when it came to either denying the faith or standing on the faith, it was a pretty easy decision for these first century apostles. You know, martyrdom is not unique to Christianity, but what is, is the way in which they died. A lot of people are willing to die for their faith, but they typically do it out on the battlefield. I believe this, you believe that. Now we're at odds, and so we're going to fight each other, and I'm willing to die because I believe this to be true. Christianity is radically and drastically different because so many of our martyrs, they died laying their lives down for the truth. Not, not physically fighting, right? Because we don't fight against flesh and blood. The ones that we fight against are in the spiritual, the demonic realm. And so you see these people that are willing to lay their lives down rather than deny the faith, to stand firm on the truth, and so give up their lives. This is what happened to Matthew. So what are the dates of Matthew? Again, this is important because there's, there's things that occurred or were alluded to in the book of Matthew that, that kind of, in some people's eyes, complicate the date. Um, Irenaeus, again, 
he writes in his in his writings against heresies. Now, this is what Irenaeus primarily did. He wrote and documented things to push back against heresies that were happening in the first and second century. So he writes against heresies. He writes that Matthew composed his gospel while Peter and Paul were still alive. So that's important for us to know. Well, okay, he's saying that it was done before these two saints died. Peter, historically, has, is um, accredited as dying between 64 to 68 AD. Paul died between 64 and 67. They both died under the hands of Emperor Nero. So it had to be under Nero's reign. And again, here's two men that were willing to lay down their lives because they'd seen the resurrected Christ. They believed this. They knew it to be true. Uh, Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down. Again, both because they were standing on the truth. But the date is important to know, uh, again, through the writings of Arrhenius, that Matthew's gospel was composed while Peter and Paul were still alive. So because of this evidence and some other evidences, Matthew is traditionally dated to be in the late 50s or into the early 60s. But if, if Matthew died around 60 AD, give or take a couple of years, um, his gospel would have to be written at the latest right before his death, unless somebody else wrote it. And there's no evidence for that. But some liberal scholars might imply that that happened um, because they don't like the implications of an early writing date. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Some liberal scholars argue for a much later date, somewhere between 75 to 100 AD. So this would have been comprised after Matthew's death. So it had to have been done by other people. So why do people argue for a later date? Again, I've been studying quite a bit. There's, there's really no evidence for a later date. There's just a, a presupposed position that people bring in that they don't want to accept a later date. And why is that? Well, liberal scholars generally do not accept a pre-AD 70 date because they reject supernatural prophecy. They love all the historicity of scripture. Man, it's so accurate when you're looking at history, when you're looking at uh, geology, um, and, and, and you're looking at all these different things, anthropology, you're looking at wars, you're looking at the things that happened in our history. They love that stuff because the Bible is so accurate in, in its details. But when we come to the supernatural, that's where a lot of these liberal scholars will start to pump the brakes. It's hard for them to believe in this. Well, why is it important that Matthew is done after A.D. 70? What's important about A.D. 70? What was that? The destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, right? That, that in Matthew's gospel, Jesus alludes to, and then he clearly predicts the destruction of Jerusalem in Matthew 21, 43, 22, 7, and in chapter 24. And so that poses a problem to liberal scholars who don't want to believe in the supernatural, that it's so detailed that the, the temple is going to be destroyed they say, well, it had to happen, it had to be comprised after A.D. 70. And what they're really saying is that people came in and they tampered with the text. That's the only way that it could happen. But again, there's, there is an evidence that supports that claim. Uh, in Matthew 21 and 22, you see Jesus is teaching parables about the destruction. And he's, he's specifically talking to the leaders in Jerusalem. And, and, he, and he alludes to their destruction and things that are going to happen. And then in chapter 24, um, it's very specific. Matthew chapter 24, verse 1 and 2. Uh, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. We see in other gospels, they were marveling at the temple. What a beautiful work. Uh, do you see all these things, he, Jesus asked, Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. And this happened exactly as Jesus said in AD 70. So again, it's prophecy of what was to happen when Rome would destroy the temple. But also, chapter 24 is prophesying about is what still is going to come. So a lot of prophecy you see in Scripture, it's, it's happening now. And it's going to be ultimately fulfilled in the future. And this is what we see with Matthew chapter 24. 
So what is the purpose of Matthew writing this? Or what is the purpose of the Gospels in general? The Gospels are not meant to be a a biography of Jesus' life. In fact, apart from the birth narratives that you have in Matthew and in Luke, um, really, the Gospels give us very little information about the first 30 years of Jesus' life. But that's because of why they exist. What's the point of the Gospels? These letters are accurate historically, and they present important biographical information. However, the primary purpose of the Gospels are theological, and they are apologetical. So they're theological, and they are telling us about God, who He is, and what He has done, and they're apologetical because they're giving us evidences for our faith. Why can you believe that Jesus truly is who He claimed to be? All the evidence that we can argue for a rational, reasonable faith in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, as the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah. That's why we have the Gospels. And Matthew's primary purpose in his documentation of Jesus, his life, his fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures, his death, his resurrection... It's to show and demonstrate to a primarily Jewish audience that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. He's the one they've been waiting for. They've been waiting for Messiah to come for a very long time. Jesus comes. He fulfills so much that they see in the Old Testament scriptures. All these prophecies concerning Messiah, Matthew was writing to connect these dots. All these things that Jesus has done, man, it's, it's rooted in the Old Testament Jesus is the fulfillment. He's writing all these evidences, historical evidence about what Christ has done, what he has fulfilled, directly connecting him to the Old Testament so that a Jewish audience and all of us would believe that Jesus is the Messiah. little background and setting. Um, Again, the evidence that we see when we look at a lot of the information found in Matthew's gospel is that the, Jew, the audience was primarily Jewish. Some examples um, for that claim. Matthew's genealogy connects Jesus back to Abraham. Luke's connects it all the way back to Adam. But if you're writing to a primarily Jewish audience, you don't have to take it back to Adam. You connect Jesus through the bloodline to King David and then connect him through the bloodline to Father Abraham. And if you're a Jewish audience, you you don't need to go further than that. You know where Abraham's bloodline goes back to, all the way back to creation, all the way back to Adam. So Matthew doesn't feel the need to bring us all the way back to Adam. Luke does. His audience is different. He has to show that, man, this bloodline of Christ goes all the way back to the very first humans, Adam, that was created in the image of God. And so again, this is an example that Matthew is speaking to a primarily Jewish audience. Also, Matthew's gospel quotes from the Old Testament prophetic passages more than 60 times. This is to emphasize how Jesus truly is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy concerning the Messiah. So as you look through Matthew, I'm just going to look at a couple of the first couple of chapters. Look how many times he's connecting this to Old Testament prophecy. Uh, So Matthew chapter 1, when he's talking about the virgin birth, uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophets. And then he quotes the prophets. Uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 5. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophets. And then he quotes from the prophets. Uh, still in chapter 2, verse 17. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. And then he quotes from the prophet Jeremiah. Chapter 3, uh, verse 3. For this, he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said. And then he talks about a voice in the wilderness crying out. And it's just over and over and over again through Matthew's gospel. Again, because he has a God-given task to connect Jesus to the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. That he's not just a Jesus who was like a prophet. He's not just a Jesus who was a good teacher. He wasn't a good guy. He was God in flesh. He was the Messiah who takes away the sins of the world. This is who he is. This is Matthew's point. in quoting from all these Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah, showing that Jesus is in fact him. 
The probability that Matthew's audience was primarily Jewish is further evidenced from several facts. A few more. Matthew usually cites Jewish customs without explaining it. Um, other gospels, they'll cite a Jewish custom and then they'll give some background and some information about it because other cultures, they don't understand it. But Matthew, he's explaining things uh, without a lot of detail because he assumes that that first century audience, they understand. And he talks about Jewish cu- customs or, or um, things that, customs that they're doing. He doesn't need to explain it because they already know. Uh, Matthew constantly refers to Christ as the son of David. Jewish audience would have understood that. Matthew even guards Jewish sensitivities about speaking the name of God by referring to the kingdom of heaven where other evangelists speak of the kingdom of God. Did you know that Matthew is the only scriptures that talk about the kingdom of heaven? It's always the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. But he's talking to a Jewish audience that the name of Yahweh is so holy that you don't even want to write out the whole name. You don't want to speak it because there's fear of blaspheming his name. So Matthew would have had an additional stumbling block by constantly saying the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. So he doesn't use it. He uses the kingdom of heaven. And this is a signature phrase only found in his gospel. And he uses kingdom of heaven 32 times. And kingdom of heaven is a euphemism for God, for God's kingdom. And again, it's removing a a potential stumbling block uh, because he is speaking to a primarily Jewish audience. But anytime you see this kingdom of heaven, this is talking about the kingdom of God. The structure, many scholars suggest that Matthew divided his gospel into three sections based on the phrase, then begin Jesus. And it kind of is ushering in this new phase in Jesus' ministry. So the first section marks Jesus' birth to his preparation. That you have the birth of Christ that fulfills all these scriptures. Um, you have Herod, who is wanting to kill this new coming king. Uh, Jesus and his family are given a word by God. They retreat into Egypt. And then Herod kills all of the, the babies two years and younger. Um, and then after Herod dies, Jesus comes back. He's grown He is tempted in the wilderness by Satan. And then you have this ushering into the second uh, section where Jesus is going to announce the the coming kingdom. And so the second section begins with the Lord's announcement of the kingdom of heaven with the presence of the king. The kingdom of heaven is being ushered in because the king is here. Jesus is the king. He's the one bringing this kingdom, but it's not going to be completely fulfilled in this life because Jesus is ushering in an eternal kingdom. So you see this third section marks a shift to emphasize the death of the king in the eternal kingdom, where Jesus is saying, this is the kingdom of heaven. He is the king. And Jews are saying, okay, you're the one who's going to deliver us from Rome. And they're thinking of an earthly, temporal kingdom. And Jesus is saying, it's so much bigger than that. I'm going to be a deliverer for you, not just for Rome. I'm going to deliver you from the wages of your sin and your rebellion, which is eternal death. I'm delivering you from that. And the way that the king delivers you from that is by dying in your place. So Jesus switches into really putting this emphasis on his death and the eternality of his kingdom. It's not just a temporal kingdom. It is an eternal kingdom. There are five literary structures uh, and dialogues and discourses in Matthew. Again, these are things that I just present to you today. So as we're going through Matthew, I want you to kind of be familiar with this and take note of it. Uh, So different scholars kind of title them maybe a little bit different, but all these passages are the same. So they see the five dialogues or discourses throughout the scriptures. Um, Righteousness of the kingdom is one of these dialogues. Again, what Jesus is teaching on. Um, Persecution within the kingdom. Matthew chapter 10 is a big one. He's preparing his apostles to go out and they understand there's going to be some serious persecution that comes to those who proclaim the good news of Jesus. The sovereignty of the kingdom over good and evil, humility, forgiveness, and punishment in the kingdom, hypocrisy, apostasy, and exclusion from the kingdom. 
There's these five dialogues that we see. And then lastly, and then I, we want to take some time to do the Lord's Supper together. Uh, but I just, this is not an exhaustive list, but as we're going through the scriptures, we should always be asking the question, what does this reveal to us about the character of God? What does this tell us? Everything in scripture is about him, right? So even the principles that we find in scripture, they allude to the character of the God that this story is all about. And so some of the characteristics that we see about God in Matthew's gospel, we see that God is accessible. I mean, this is a big one. The accessibility for us to be crying out to God as Abba, Father. We see it in 2751. Anyone care to guess what that verse has to do with? It's after the crucifixion, something happens. The veil is torn, right? Signifying that, man, the, the people have access to the Holy of Holies. There's not this veil that's keeping us from God. We, do, we don't need a priest to intercede for us. Jesus is our great high priest. So we, we go directly to the source. So, so this is revealed, the accessibility of God to us, which we take for granted today, but it wasn't always that way. We can just cry out to him. We see that God is good. We see that God is holy. We see that God is patient. We see that God is perfect. We see that God is powerful, all-powerful, God is provident. Everything is going to happen in his power and his time. God is unequaled. There was no one like our God. God is unified. He is not divided, and his people should not be divided. God is wise, and God is just slash wrathful. And he is wrathful because he is just. And he pours out his wrath upon rebellion and sin. But that's why we have good news. While God will pour out his wrath on rebellion, he's already poured out his wrath on Jesus Christ. For those of us who place our faith in Jesus, we don't have to experience the wrath of God. Christ has already suffered all of that on our behalf. But if we reject Christ, we reject his sacrifice, we reject the way that he is made back to God, then we will suffer the wrath of God because we have rejected his, his atoning sacrifice. And so all this, again, is to just tell and demonstrate the beauty of the good news of Jesus Christ. And so as we look at Matthew, we're going to see this tapestry of Christ and, and his redemptive work for us. And see the fulfillment of so much of the Old Testament prophecy through Jesus Christ. And, and now we're going to partake in the, the bread and, and the cup, signifying the, the body of Christ that was broken for us, the blood that was shed for us. And we do this in remembrance of him because this is such good news. And we wouldn't know about any of this if it wasn't for God preserving for us these Gospels. And so I want us as we go before the, the Lord's table to really think deeply on what this is. That, that we are, it's, it's, we're remembering what Christ has done for us, but it's more than that. I'm not saying that it literally becomes his body and his blood but you know that in church history, the, the Lord's table was so significant. It was so powerful. It was so weighty. They, we don't just take a flippant approach to this. And sometimes I've been guilty of this. Right? It's, we do it at the end of the message, and maybe the message has gone long, and so we just kind of we, we, we get through it. And we should never get through this. We slow down. We ponder who it is that Jesus proclaimed to be. All that he fulfilled, the implications of the cross and the resurrection from the dead. We ponder these things. We remember him. We worship him. The Apostle Paul 
writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting with verse 27. He's writing to the church in Corinth that has been abusing this table. And he says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So you come in an unworthy manner thinking that you're checking some religious box and that God is honored by that. You're, you're deeply mistaken. In fact, Paul says, because of the lackadaisical approach that they're taking and they're doing it in an unworthy manner, he says, this is why many of you are weak and ill and some have even died. Connecting it to the way that they approach the, the Lord's table. He says, but if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. The discipline of God is his grace and his mercy and his kindness towards us. We're not illegitimate children. If we're his children, he disciplines us because he loves us. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things I will give direction when I come. See, they were coming and some were filling up on the bread. Some were coming, they were getting drunk on the wine. And we may not have that specific situation happening in the, the, the body today, but man, we can approach this in such a lackadaisical attitude that we are disgracing the Lord's table. And so I want to take a moment to do what Paul tells us to do, to take a moment to examine ourselves. Look, we all have sin in our lives. And this is an opportunity to take that before the Lord. Don't excuse your sin. Don't minimize your sin. Take it to the Lord and cry out to Him. Bring that to Him and understand that He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. So let's take a moment and let's just cry out to the Lord. Let's just prepare our hearts to share in this Lord's table together.